We kind of get into this pattern, especially if we're around the holidays, we get into this like, we're pressurized, we're manipulated, we're motivated, we feel guilt, we feel shame, we feel isolation, we feel lack of belonging, insecurity, inferiority. And so what do we do? We just try to overcompensate. And a lot of the time we try to do that through our purchases. So when we can interrupt ourselves and kind of take us out of that moment, simply by drawing our, as I say, conscious awareness to unconscious behavior, we already have a leg up. Hello, sunshine. Welcome back to Loving Money, the podcast with Lise Wilcox. That's me, your decades old, (laughs) four decades old, okay, four and a bit decades old. (laughs) What I'm trying to say is I'm old. No, really what I'm trying to say is that I can't wrap my head around the grammar or the syntax. I've been a strategic life, business, and confidence coach for the better part of a decade. And my passion is helping women make more money. That's not just about like putting more money in the bank. It's really about closing the gap between self-worth and net worth. So you know that you're in the right place. If you have been searching for an opportunity to name, de-shame, and reframe your relationship to money so that you can ultimately change your relationship to life. That is my passion, my purpose, and I'm really, really grateful to share this platform with you today. Get comfortable because we are spilling tea in this episode. At least it feels like it to me, who's kind of a money nerd and really likes to kind of gossip about stuff, (laughs) but would never otherwise admit it, even though I just admitted it on this platform, which I'm hoping becomes like a number, not number one. I'm actually not setting my hopes that high, like a top 100 podcast, but nonetheless, this is juicy. Spilling in here for the first time outside of private conversations that I have about this specific subject all the time and really giving myself permission to have it on a more public level because I think it is a conversation worthy of being had. And that question starts with, how the fuck do they afford it? You know, have you ever had those conversations either with with people in your life or maybe just in your head where you're looking around and you're like, oh my God, I do not understand this. How do they afford it? Whether it's the boat, the trailer, the vacation to Europe, the first class ticket, who knows what it is, the multiple cars. There's a, there's a, there's a family that lives down the street from me and they have three supremely luxury vehicles parked in their driveway. Three. There are two adults and one kid. And no, that kid cannot drive. It's like a seven-year-old kid but they have these like insane cars and you never see them. And you just have to wonder how the fuck do they afford it? So that's the juicy conversation we're having here today. And this is one I wish we could have in like more of a round table way, because, because honestly, let's just be real for a second. Humans are flawed, right? And part of my flaw is that I love to dish about stuff like this because I love to look and look, not look at, but like really look at, the surface level situation having little to no information at all and just wonder like how the hell are they affording this when you start to do the numbers in your head I'm very numbers oriented I don't know about you but you start to price all this stuff out and you're like but honest to god for somebody to own or what we think they own possess all the things they possess knowing what the average incomes are and incomes are like where where we live. I'm Canadian. Maybe you're listening in this in the US, Australia, UK, beyond. You know what the average salary or average revenue for your business is. And it doesn't add up. <laughs> I'm just saying. And there's an age-old adage that's like, you don't know what the bank knows, and I get it. But I'm also wondering if we can find out what the bank knows just to help us understand how the hell do they afford it. So cozy up. Grab your latte, get comfortable, and get a little little cattier than usual with me, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
But before we get into like the, the, the richness of this podcast or of this particular episode, I want to share something with you. I launched my first course in September and it has been doing so well. <laughs> I'm so proud of it. Launching a course is really hard. I'll just say that. It's really, really hard. There are so many moving pieces. And it's not like, you know, going to war hard. It's not like working three jobs just so your kids can eat hard. It's just like, it's so much to manage. There are so many moving pieces. And I just have to, like, I crack up when I get Instagram ads because you know that I've been like in the course creator, content creator space for a little bit. You know, your phone is always listening. Well, my phone is literally always listening and now sending me targeted ads of like, create your course in seven days. And I'm just sitting there like throwing back popcorn. I'm like, really? Really? How is one creating like, okay, technically God created the world in seven days. I get it. (laughs) Hard things can be done, but still like creating a course in seven days, this does not sound easy or manageable to me. All that to say, having a source of passive income is such a gift and I'm, (laughs) it sounds so meta, I am going to be releasing a course on actually how to build a course that is like no holds barred. It's the reality of here's every single bloody step that, that you have to take in releasing a course. I have found in my years of research, usually when people offer a course, it's like it's build a course in three easy steps. One, see steps A through X. Step two, see steps A through Z. You get these like this three easy step that actually has like a billion T steps in between. So I'm going to be releasing a course at some time soon. I hope not in seven days. I'll tell you that right now. (laughs) Releasing a course for those service providers or anybody who has IP, intellectual property, that they don't know what to do with and they really want to package it out. I'm taking my very Dutch, very Torian approach and making it ultra practical, ultra lifestyle friendly and ultra actionable so that you can take that IP, you can take all of that wisdom and turn it into almost literal gold by like actually having a beautiful course framework and a really killer strategy that, ah, gasp, actually has an impact on people's lives. Really, really passionate about that. Anyway, so my own course, Loving Money, is (laughs) ironically seven days to transforming your self-sabotaging money beliefs into long lasting success. It is, it feels like therapy about money. It's very humbly. It's really, really good. It's less than 200 bucks, but if you want to use code loving money at checkout, if you save, I think about 10%, it's about $20. And I designed it to be purely, how do I say this? So much intention and care and energy and integrity went into designing this course that to make sure it's a foundational course. Like it's, it's even, it's even before money mindset. It's like, it's the, it's the stuff that money mindset doesn't even cover. It's a very trauma informed approach to your relationship with money. If you like the podcast, you're going to fucking love the course. I'll tell you that right now. I'm really proud of it. I'm going to stop talking about it, except I am going to share with you one of the, one of the pieces of feedback, some of the reviews that I've had from the course that says, this was such an amazing experience to work through. I didn't realize how much trauma plays a role in my financial life. I loved the humor, compassion, and care that went into the modules. The pace was great and the content blew my mind. Eee! How I how I react to that. That's from Marie, who's a 36-year-old serial entrepreneur. And I'm so glad. I've actually talked to Marie about this in person, but I'm so glad that that is the level of impact we're talking about with this course, because that's the point. You know, I don't want to, as a person who's like really highly driven by integrity, I don't want to put something out that you're wasting money on. It'd be pretty predatory, cruel, dare I say, fucking dumb. If I put out a course on loving money and it was actually designed to get you to waste your money, this is really designed for you to take massive impact in a very short period of time by actually looking at your relationship to money, but I'm going to stop talking about it. Um, Today, we are talking about how do they afford it, but I'm going to frame it under the umbrella of, I tricked you, of overspending. Ah, 
you don't know what the bank knows, but you do know what your bank knows about you. And if if you are somebody who's ever been in the camp of overspending, and yes, I could go and look at myself in the mirror right now when I say this, you know the highs and the lows that overspending can bring. It can almost feel like an addiction sometimes. Like if you're really, if you're really in it, overspending can feel like a legit addiction because you do, you get such a dopamine rush from the, from the purchase. You get a huge adrenaline rush that comes from not knowing if you're going to be able to make your bills on time. That's a real thing. Interestingly, the gambler's high Gamblers don't get addicted to the feeling of winning. They get addicted to the feeling that happens just before they know if they've won or lost. It's such a rush, that peak moment of adrenaline that like, ah, my life is about to change forever or ah, my life is about to change forever. It's so chemical. In an overspending, we have a chemical reaction to it, but there's also a behavioral pattern at play that I really want to look at and analyze today in a, in a, you know, my typical signature style of name, de-shame, reframe. And all of this is linked to the juicy nature of how the fuck do they afford it? Because it's so inextricably linked together. I've read the stats before. I've shared the stats here before. Like, yes, I've read them, but yes, I've shared them here before that 17% of people in North America are outspending what they're earning. And the average amount of consumer debt, so that's like non-mortgage debt in certainly both Canada and the US is over 20K. So it's not just a couple of people who are under who are overspending, like a lot of people are overspending. And I just think it's time to have this conversation in a way that isn't, oh, has the the doormat. Have you ever seen these doormats for sale that are like Dear UPX guy, don't ring the doorbell or hide the packages so my husband doesn't know that you're here. Like that's not talking about overspending. That is just creating a trope around women that is a further patriarchal institution and system that we don't belong in or want to be beholden to. We want to talk about overspending in this very practical, actionable, compassionate gentle, but affirming way so that we can maybe actually do something about it. So today we're going to be talking about not what I was going to say, what is overspending? I'm I'm pretty sure we can, we can get there on our own, but what is overspending? Why we do it and what to do about it. And again, this is all linked to this very salacious, juicy, like how the fuck are people affording life? When you look around, as I said, you don't know what the bank knows. And it's easy to make judgments for better or for worse about the, you know, people down the street driving these like crazy cars or people living in insane houses or going on luxurious vacations or there's a whole, especially, especially after summer break, if you start to look at people's Instagram feeds and you're like, you went to Positano for four weeks? Like how? Like, I'm not trying to be a dick or be crass, but literally how did you do that? Like, do you not work? And how do you have a job? How do you have a job where you don't work or a life where you don't work? But that also affords you the chance to go to Positano for four weeks. This brings up so many questions and curiosities. I don't know about you, but it plagues me because I literally just don't understand. And when I don't understand something, it like eats away at my brain and it sends it into like a chaos loop. Welcome to my world. So for overspending tied to how do they afford it? I mean, personally, I think they go hand in hand, right? Like, how are they actually affording this if we know the salary is this or the general salary is this and the general cost of something is that? How do we juxtapose the two? Well, let's look at what overspending is. Again, that sounds so stupid to say out loud, but whatever. Why we do it and what to do about it, okay? Overspending clearly is spending a lot of money. (laughs) I'm not even going to quantify that because it's so relative, but overspending is not just like, you know, Oh, I bought too many groceries today. Or like I bought a few extra steaks. So have your friends stay for dinner. Or I don't know. I bought the kids like a couple extra pair of sneakers this year, just in case I'm not talking about like a little bit of things I'm talking about. Wow. That level of spending does not line up with what you're earning. 
And this is not pot kettle black over here. Overspending has been my personal, probably my greatest financial self-sabotage since I was a kid. And to explain that, to qualify that, I'm going to tell you my story, and I'm hoping that you can then take away from this the chance to reflect on your own story. So when I look back at my own money story, I, and I I actually talk about this a lot in the course so we can really get clear on what your specific money story is, but I look back at my very first money memory and the impact that it had on me. And I realized that for me, from a very early age, like maybe age five, money was something I learned to keep secret. I learned to keep it hidden and a little bit of shame kind of came in there. Like having money seemed shameful. So instead I would hide it away, but also having money made me feel so powerful. And it wasn't the having of the money. Cause I think I was terrified of being caught or found out for having money as a kid, but using that money, like taking it and turning it into stuff that I would then hoard away or hide away, it made me feel so rich and powerful, Uh, rich in power and also rich, comma, and powerful. I grew up in a pretty chaotic home environment. There was a lot of emotional abuse. There's a lot of financial abuse. And there was, well, while those things were definitely present, what was not present was a sense of safety, security, peace, and comfort. I had such an absence of control that, you know, I didn't have a lot of control over my environment. I was in a highly controlled environment, didn't have a lot of freedom. And so the chance to create my own security or sense of safety, start to exert a little more power and control. For me, I found that in spending. Now, Again, because of my own family dynamic, for better or for worse, I have like an an insane work ethic as a result, but maybe I was a little too young. I don't know. I've been working at least two jobs since I was 12. And that means that since I was 12, like I've always been really good at making money, (laughs) like really, really good, you know, uh, for a few years in high school, I had like three jobs, three jobs. When you're, when you have three jobs and no financial responsibility, it's a shit ton of coin. and As I went into university, you know, I was a sociology student and I've got lots to say about what I would have done differently about that. But the reality is that I was a sociology student and most of my classes didn't start until two consistently. As a morning person, that means I had all that time in the day with like nothing to do. So naturally I did what I knew best and I worked, you know, I did put myself through school with the exception of a few thousand bucks my parents had, or my dad had saved for me in an RSP. But other than that, like I paid for it and I graduated with graduated. I'm so like passionate about this. My voice speeds up. So my bad. I'll try to slow it down. I paid for most of school and I'm really fucking proud of that. And it's. I graduated debt free and it was something that I never really had people around me to celebrate that, but I'm sharing that now. And if, if you're in that same boat, like, let me celebrate with you. That's a, that's a huge accomplishment. I know there are a lot of us that had that financial independence from an early age and let's just high five each other from afar, wherever you are. Anyway. So I had a full-time job while I was putting myself through school and I worked at this amazing bakery and cafe and I would go and open it up at like five 30 in the morning. I would have a nice latte, a pound of chocolate. I gained like 30 pounds. And when I finished my shift, I would just walk to campus and then do my classes. It was pretty incredible. All that to say, I've been always very good at making money because I didn't have any sense of financial education or financial literacy for a very, very, very long time. I basically spent whatever I made. Like, yes, I had some saved for school, but otherwise it was like, it was, how do I say this? It was so out of control that instead of doing my laundry, we didn't have the house that I rented with friends. We didn't have laundry facilities. So we had to go to a laundromat and that just felt so inconvenient that because I was walking downtown to go to work every day, I would literally stop at the gap on my way home from work to buy new clothes instead of doing laundry. Like, you know how fucked up that is? But again, my adult self can give my 
much younger self a lot of compassion because she had no idea what she was doing and she had no framework no adult guiding her and being like, okay, sweetheart, instead of buying new jeans twice a week, why don't we do this with your money instead? Like I look back and think, had I just invested, uh, had I invested in property or stocks or even just a high yield savings account instead of clothes from the gap, I'd probably be in a different financial position that I am right now. Who knows that if, if I'd even be doing this podcast, maybe I'd already be retired <laughs> anyway. I always have a lot of money. I was really good at making money, but I had no idea what to do with it. And when you have little education or information around money, coupled with a feeling of power, security, freedom, independence, control, comfort, and peace, we kind of have a perfect storm. So when we look at like, how are people affording this? And also why do we overspend? Can you see that the gap is kind of shrinking between those two? We overspend because we are trying to get one of our deep unconscious needs met. Now our unconscious speaks through the body and through our nervous system. So as a master trained NLP coach, I use the language a lot of the unconscious and the unconscious mind and what do we hold uh, in our deeply embedded unconscious beliefs. It's become a lot buzzier, trendier, and frankly, I think more understandable for people to use the language of nervous system. They're the same. So we can use whatever, whatever label you want here, but we have deeply internalized beliefs that shape our outlook on life, on how we act, on our, our behavior how we feel about money, like all of our wealth EQ comes from our money story and the beliefs that have existed, usually from somebody else that are kind of deeply embedded within us. And that speaks through our nervous system. So when we feel really uncomfortable, either with too much money or not enough money, it's usually one of those beliefs speaking through our nervous system, alerting us to some sort of perceived danger. Well, in the same vein, if we feel that that sensation of not enough or not belonging or not safe. We're going to do everything in our power to get out of that discomfort. So sometimes we turn to alcohol and, you know, we have those feelings of discomfort. And so we reach for a drink and we're like, oh, I know exactly what to do about that. Some of us take it one step further to really numb out those feelings and numb out that pain and go straight to drugs. And that's its own thing. We're not going to get into into that here. Um, Smoking, same thing. You want to take the edge off, light up a quick cigarette, and it goes away, right? We're reaching to meet a need that we are unable to meet at an unconscious level. Food is a huge reach. Sex is another huge reach where we reach for sex with often the wrong people, or we reach for risky sex with the wrong people. What we're trying to do is not get laid. We're trying to meet an unrequited need that we have. And that's our like self-sabotage weapon of choice is to pursue that avenue. And I should note that all of these things can turn into addiction when they kind of jump the shark and turn into a like a legit mental health thing. And overspending is the same. We're going to stay just on that side before it gets into addiction because the the more mental health side of this is definitely not within my scope of expertise, expertise rather. But I can say with a great degree of confidence, there is that that period before we go full blown addict where it is a pattern of behavior, where we're just trying to get a need met. Spending money is the same. We are reaching for something to get us out of the discomfort of how we feel. Anytime we have experienced a trauma in our lives, and you know that could be capital T trauma, it could be little t trauma, it doesn't matter what the trauma is. It matters that we experienced it. And as a trauma-informed coach, I can tell you when we experience that trauma, What happens is that it leaves behind an emotional wound from the thing that happened. So we have like, one, we have the thing that happened. Two, we have the emotional implication left behind from the thing that happened. Three, we have the pattern, behavior, substance, whatever, the reach that we turn to or the the thing that we reach for to numb 
the feelings, the discomfort, the pain of the emotional effect left behind from the thing that happened. And four, when we really get into healing mode, which is where we are here now, hello, I see you and welcome. What we're doing is tuning back into the story or back into those into the discomfort so we can get clarity on what was the emotional impact left behind from the thing that happened. So when we stop reaching outward and we start reaching inward, what we're doing is setting ourselves up for massive healing to get clear on, hmm, maybe I don't have an overspending problem. Maybe I have an unrequited need for safety, comfort, and security. You know, for the last let's say 36 years, <laughs> just to pick a random number. Uh, what I've been doing is not spending too much money or not having a shopping problem, but I've been reaching to create a sense of safety and security for myself where there was none before. So I would love for you to take a moment and just, just think about that. As I said in the course, like I really take you through this process and there are, there are prompts, there are activities, there's like one-on-one audio coaching to take this to the next level for you and really help you walk through this process because this is legit. Like this is trauma-informed work. It creates a massive opportunity for healing. But think about what that is for you. Like what is your reach If you are here listening to this episode, I'm assuming that at least a small part of you relates to overspending as your reach. And I want you to think about what are you really reaching for? Like you're not really reaching for another black sweater from the Gap. I know I've I've bought all the black sweaters they have to offer. And I'm telling you, you don't need another black sweater. This isn't about that. It's not about a conscious response or a rational response of uh, lease. Don't you already have seven black sweaters? Maybe you don't need another one. This is not a rational behavior. This is an irrational response to an unconscious feeling. So when you're reaching for that overspending or for the rush of dopamine you get from the Amazon purchase, the rush of like beating the system, like there are all kinds of things designed, built into online shopping, for example, that's like, oh, act fast. 42 people just added this to their cart today. Or, you know, you go to the Lululemon sale that's like, we made too much. And it's like, oh, quick, we got to act now. We only have two left before this goes away forever. That capitalizes and is designed to capitalize on this scarcity part of your brain that literally makes you feel like you're going to go without resources. And your brain can't tell the difference between oh, woe is me, I'm going to go without form-fitting yoga pants and I'm not going to have enough to eat. It triggers the same chemical response. So we are motivated and because we live in such an overly capitalistic society, we are pushed, pressured, and motivated all the time. Uh, Manipulated is actually a better way of saying that. We are manipulated all the time into reacting from a place of scarcity, fear, and looking for belonging, but we do it through our credit card number, right? As long as you can remember the little three-digit CVC code on the back of your card, you're golden. You can buy all the security for yourself that you want. But that brings us to kind of our third point of this trifecta. Like, what do we do about that? So once you know that you are overspending, which, you know, can take a little bit of self-reflection and probably some, some tears, Then you can look a little bit deeper, which probably is going to have a few more tears about why, like, why are you overspending? Um, What are you reaching for? What is the feeling you're trying to create for yourself? Then we can get into the, so what do we do about it? Once you're really clear on your money story and what that wound is or what that the unrequited need is that's trying to get met, then you can ask yourself in those moments of like, I must have these moccasins. They're only $44.99. They only have two size tens left. You can, I'm not pulling this from personal experience or anything, just so you know, you can start to walk yourself through the, this like self-coaching, self-advocacy process of like, okay, hang on a second. Like, do I just love these moccasins? Cause that's okay. Like you're allowed to have great style. Do I love the rush at what I'm about to do? This feeling of like, I might get caught buying something I'm not supposed to buy right now. Am I looking for a sense of comfort? Am I looking for a sense of the treat? Do I want to feel like somebody's taking care of me? Am I trying to do that for myself? 
do I feel like my world is crumbling out of control because the economy is crap and I don't know what to do about it. So instead I'll just reach for spending because then at least I feel like I can control something. Like all of these are real feelings that we have. And those real feelings cre- are, are based in our nervous system that are telling us we are going to die if we don't get this need met. And so we, you know, water always finds the groove. We go back to the thing we've always done to help bring that sense of peace, comfort, security, whatever it is. So if you can start to interrupt that process, that's usually the first step of taking yourself out of that pattern. Yes, there is work to be done. I specialize in this when I work on work with people one-on-one, any of my courses, any of my group programs, it's all trauma informed in the, in their design. So we can go together and look at what are those old stories? What are those old patterns? What are those old feelings that you were trying to get met? And we can start to replace them with healthier behaviors and like start to kind of rewire, reprogram your brain. It sounds really funky, but it's, it's awesome. It's like massively healing and it's way more effective than traditional talk therapy. But even for yourself, you can just interrupt that moment of like, hang on a second, what am I doing here? Like, instead of getting caught up in the moment of like, I see it, I like it, I want it, I buy it. Why do I want it? Like, what purpose does this serve? What feeling am I trying to create or what feeling, what wound am I trying to heal? What am I trying to give myself in this moment that these moccasins happen to be like the talisman of? Interrupting your own behaviors is enough to just, what's the right word without using interrupting again? It's like, it disrupts it. It's like, it kind of punctures that invisible bubble that you're living in that just kind of keeps you on autopilot. And instead it draws your conscious awareness to your unconscious behavior simply by checking in and asking yourself why or what or how or who, like there are a series of questions you can ask yourself, as I said, to interrupt that moment, take yourself out of that really, what's the right word for this? You know, when you're having a bad day and all you want to do is eat comfort food and like sit on the couch in your track pants and like binge watch a show and you kind of do it on autopilot. You just, and frankly, like, please tell me we've all done this before. I can't be the only person who knows exactly what this feeling is called. I don't know what the feeling is called. I just know how it feels, but you know, that feeling where you're just like, oh, here we go. I'm just going to get into it. I'm going to sink back into the pocket right now. Even if I know I shouldn't be doing this, or if this is not a good or healthy choice for me. It feels so good. I'm going to let myself go there. It's the same thing with spending. We kind of get into this pattern, especially if we're around the holidays, we get into this, like we're pressurized, we're manipulated, we're motivated. We feel guilt. We feel shame. We feel isolation. We feel lack of belonging, insecurity, inferiority. And so what do we do? We just try to overcompensate. And a lot of the time we try to do that through our purchases. So when we can interrupt ourselves and t- kind of take us out of that moment simply by drawing our, as I say, conscious awareness to unconscious behavior, we already have a leg up. Yes, this is big, juicy, deep work that certainly we can pursue together, but this is a great first step to get you started. As I mentioned, the course is an excellent second step to get you started that's pretty low investment for a pretty high impact if I, if I do say so myself. So when you're, when you're looking at overspending and you find yourself caught in that like popcorn eating moment of like, how the hell do they afford this? Now we can really start to narrow that gap and be like, okay, maybe lease, we can take some of the judgment and the gossip out of this and be like, how do they afford it? Can you believe it? And really look at, okay, maybe there's something going on that I have no idea about, not only do I not know what the bank knows, I have no idea what their therapist knows. I have no idea what their own trauma story looks like. I have no idea the feelings that go unmet and what terror that must bring them in their daily lives. And when we start to use that lens of compassion and grace, we start to let not only the people around us off the hook, but we start to let ourselves off the hook because then we feel like we don't have to judge ourselves so intensely and then further motivate ourselves to get more into our self-sabotaging behaviors. How'd that land for you? I am so passionate about this. And, you know, as with all things money, 
we're ver- virtually never allowed to talk about them, which is why I get so obsessive about talking about them here. And thank you for joining me. Like, thank you so much for showing up for you and having these conversations and just allowing us to, again, puncture that barrier around us, that invisible barrier that tells us we're not allowed to talk about money or that good girls don't talk about money or that it's crass to talk about money, therefore keeping us in the dark, keeping us in an oppressive system. The only way we change our relationship to the system, to the patriarchy, to our lives is to actually change our relationship to money and start to take back our own agency over how we feel about money. And when we're able to act from a place where we feel confident and we feel informed and we feel supportive and dare I say, we feel loving, it is like, it is a brand new reality for how we show up for ourselves. Thank you so much for making season one of this podcast a real pleasure and a real success. If you use code loving money, you can head over to my website and grab your copy of the course, especially if the overspending narrative has resonated with you. I have a feeling you're about to give yourself the gift of massive impact. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you are having a beautiful, luxurious, wonderful day, no matter where you are. And I cannot wait to see you on season two. Take care. 